We're, I'm Sarah Hawley. Um, for people that may not know me, I'm the faculty lead for our education and training work group here at IHPI. And we're really excited to have um, a seminar today with Dr. Pooja Lagasetti. Um, she is an assistant professor in the Division of General Medicine and research scientist in the CCMR at the Ann Arbor VA. Her research, as I know many of you know, and she'll be talking about today, focuses on addressing barriers and developing interventions to better treat chronic pain and addiction across general medical settings, excuse me. So we're super excited to have Pooja here and um, I'm gonna turn it over to her. What we're going to do is let um, Dr. Legacetti speak and we'll have questions and discussion at the end. Feel free to put your questions in the chat. We'll keep our eye on those and we can bring them back um, at the end of the seminar today. Also, when we're done, we will be having uh, time to go into breakout rooms for a little bit of additional conversation for anyone who can stick around. Um, we've done this in the past and it's given people a chance to kind of continue to chat and meet each other. So stay on the line if you're interested in that and you'll be placed into a breakout room at the end. So Pooja, thank you so much for being with us today. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm thankful to IHPI for allowing me this opportunity to talk today. Um, and talk about access to care barriers for people who use opioids. All right, um, Dr. Holly already gave an introduction to, to who I am, but you know, I'm a general internist and an addiction medicine um, physician. I also do research at the Ann Arbor VA. I don't have any conflicts of interest and the vast majority of the studies that I'm gonna be talking about today were funded by the Michigan Health Endowment Fund. So today's objectives, um, I'm going to start off with a brief review of the opioid epidemic and treatment landscape for patients with chronic pain. I'll describe the major barriers to accessing pain treatment, and then we'll talk about a few potential solutions. So I think this slide is probably familiar to many of you who have chosen to attend the seminar. Um, U.S. drug-related overdoses continue to climb, and we thought we were seeing a little bit of plateau right before COVID happened, um, but last year there were greater than 100,000 deaths related to drug overdoses. I really like this slide because it also shows just how this epidemic is evolving with respect to what type of opioids um, are responsible for a lot of the overdoses. As you can see, the vast majority of the overdoses in the past couple of years have been driven by synthetic opioids, mainly fentanyl derivatives, as compared to in the early 2000s where we were seeing all opioids, including prescription opioids, a bit more. Before we dive in, I think it's important to do a few definitions um, to help kind of base this talk. So um, very quickly, how do we define chronic pain versus how do we define an opioid use disorder, OUD. So chronic pain is longstanding pain that's lasted greater than three months and can occur along with a chronic health condition, and it affects your functioning and quality of life. Opioid use disorder, on the other hand, is a pathologic pattern of opioid use involving cravings and the inability to abstain and problems with one's behaviors and interpersonal relationships. Now, sometimes these two conditions can be linked. In fact, people think that maybe around 10%, if even that, um, individuals with chronic pain actually have an opioid use disorder. However, I really want to draw attention to the fact that this is a spectrum and often unlinked. Um, but, you know, we in the popular media and journalism, et cetera, have often kind of linked all opioid use to be the same. And so it's important to understand some of the different contexts in which people are using opioids. So who is affected by the opioid epidemic? Um, and so there's currently around 10 million people who are prescribed opioids for chronic pain annually. So this does not include new starts for a surgery or something like that. Versus there's around two and a half million people that we estimate have an opioid use disorder in 2020. And again, some of these individuals may overlap, but most of them do not. So one of the first things that I, you know, my research team has been really focused on is really trying to think about how opioid prescribing policies, which have been enacted to kind of curb the opioid epidemic, have affected access to treatment for patients with chronic pain. And by policies, you know, policies can range from, you know, can be wide ranging, but here's just a few examples of some of the opioid policies that have been enacted that I'm talking about. 
So we could talk about nationally with things like the drug enforcement agencies, licensing and monitoring. We can also talk about things like guidelines that have been released, the 2016 guidelines, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the revision that has just been released this past week. In the state of Michigan, for example, we have a lot of different kind of smaller policies that are instituted at the health system level as well, such as kind of the opioid start talking form that has to be filled out by patients every time they initiate an opioid, reviewing the prescription drug monitoring program, which um, clinicians have to review prior to prescribing any opioids. Um, different insurances um, might have doses and duration limits as to how high a physician can prescribe their medications. And then there's also legal sanctions that have, can be enacted um, if there's non-compliance with these with these policies. And you know, I think most would argue that many of the policies that have been enacted have, I think, had one of their intended um, kind of hopes, um, you know, accomplished or goals accomplished, uh, because U.S. opioid prescribing is actually at an all-time low, um, lower than it's been in the last 10 to 15 years. However, there's been concern that this restrictive prescribing has led to unintended consequences for patients with chronic pain. Here's a few headlines that highlight this. Don't force patients off of opioids abruptly, the new guidelines say, warnings of severe risk. Here's the New York Times, good news, opioid prescribing fell, the bad, pain patients suffer, doctors say. And this is acknowledging the plight of pain patients in the U.S. And this was an initial article talking about how the CDC had planned to revise their guidelines, which they have done at this point. And so what we're stuck with is a bit of a balancing act. We're, you know, trying to manage effective pain treatment um, while preventing uh, somebody from developing an opioid use disorder. And so how do we do that without kind of tipping the scales in one direction or the other? So before we get into this, I think we should talk about what effective pain treatment looks like. And so this um, is developed by the Health and Human Services um, Agency, which the CDC guidelines kind of worked hand in hand to develop their new guidelines at this point. But they basically say that chronic pain should be multimodal treatment. So that means there should be medications. Um, we should be considering behavioral health approaches. We should be thinking about restorative therapies, integrative approaches, such as acupuncture, and also interventional approaches, and that all chronic pain should be kind of, it's complex, and it should be treated um, with this multimodal approach and not just medications alone. But the question comes up, well, how do patients actually access this type of multimodal treatment? And so our team um, has developed a conceptual model just kind of walking through how people in general access pain treatment. And, you know, first a patient kind of comes to a primary care office and tries to seek care at primary care. Then usually their PCP works with them on diagnosis and treatment planning. And then this PCP has to basically have access either within their clinic or through referrals to this multimodal treatment plan. On top of it, the patient has to have the means, um, either through insurance or other ways, to actually access this effective multimodal treatment if the referral is placed. But can patients taking opioids for chronic pain actually get this? And so our first study that I'll talk about aimed to basically answer this question. We wanted to see how opioid policies affected treatment access, particularly primary care treatment access for patients with chronic pain. And we basically used a secret shopper method where we called clinics to assess whether patients on long-term opioids have access to scheduling new primary care appointments. And we did this by simulating a patient needing an appointment. And this secret shopper method has been used in prior studies of healthcare access, particularly to reduce response bias. We called the clinics, you know, and just surveyed them. They probably, you know, maybe you know, they might have a social desirability bias to report kind of higher rates of acceptance compared to when we simulate a patient call. So we called 667 primary care clinics and asked about, you know, the first thing that we did was kind of a survey um, just to get a sense of which clinics we were talking to. And we asked them, you know, what type of prescribers do you have, physicians, DOs, PAs, MPs, what type of insurances you accept, your general appointment availability. So we wanted primary care clinics that had appointment availability. 
and whether their patients, providers used medications for opioid use disorder, um, including things like buprenorphine or methadone, because we hypothesized that clinics that were more willing to treat opioid use disorder would maybe be more willing to accept patients on prescribed opioids for chronic pain. So we randomized the clinics to a simulated patient with either private or Medicaid um, insurance type. And we called 186 eligible clinics. Half, but roughly half the clinics got a call from a Blue Cross Blue Shield patient. The other half got a call from a patient that had Medicaid. And in all of these situations, a research assistant called each clinic trying to request a new appointment for a mother who had chronic pain. Um, in the phone call, they would reveal their mother's health insurance and would ask, before we get too far, is it okay if my mother takes prescription opioids for chronic pain? And the data was discouraging. When this um, simulated you know, RA tried to call for an appointment to schedule an appointment for their mom, 41% of the primary care clinics wouldn't accept a new patient on, with chronic pain on opioids. And as a reminder, these were P, you know, clinics that all had availability. Um, and it didn't really matter whether our patient had Medicaid versus private insurance. So why is this happening? You know, it's likely because of a combination of multiple reasons. One, you know, there's a lot of administrative burdens um, due to the many policies that we spoke about earlier, you know, checking the prescription drug monitoring program, filling out a treatment contract, um, you know, having to refill the prescription every month, all of these things take a lot of time. And so you can imagine that primary care clinics and providers would be kind of reluctant to increase their pool of patients for which they're having to do this. There's also probably a fear of sanctions and liability. If I prescribe opioids incorrectly, um, will I get in trouble legally? And so is it just easier to say, nope, I'm just not gonna do it at all. The other question that comes up, I think a lot for, um, for me is, well, how much of this is also just stigma? Um, you know, stigma and chronic pain has been discussed for many years preceding kind of the opioid epidemic. Um, and there's also been a lot of stigma around opioid prescribing in general or opioid phobia. And so it's unclear how much of this is kind of clinics really don't want to do this because of the policies or, you know, more, this is just a patient population that they don't want to take on. And so to explore the role of stigma, or at least try to get at this, we expanded the study and we included eight additional states that had um, high, medium, and low overdose rates. And we asked another question this time. We said, does the reason for needing a new appointment, um, new patient appointment matter? So this time we called each clinic two times um, to schedule a patient visit. And in both scenarios, both calls, we said, I've been a, I, you know, I'm a patient that's been taking Percocet for years, but in scenario one, the, um, the research assistant would say, my doctor just retired, which that was the reason for needing a new appointment. In scenario two, we would say that my doctor just stopped prescribing Percocet for me. As you can imagine, scenario one was what we kind of thought was kind of the less stigmatizing scenario um, versus scenario two, you know, somebody could interpret their reason for needing a new doctor to potentially include uh, reasons for misuse. And what we found was reason, reasons for needing an opioid um, prescription, you know, did affect access. So of the clinics we called, 75% responded the same to both scenarios. So two calls, they said the same thing each time. 32% said, sure, let's set up an appointment and we can discuss it then. And again, 43% said no in both scenarios. So this was similar to our Michigan alone statistic. Interestingly, 25% of our clinics responded differently to each scenario. So that means on one phone call, they said yes. On another phone call, they said no. And what we found was in these 25% of these clinics, they were twice as likely to say yes in the situation where the doctor had retired, um, indicating that even when we hold policies the same, so a clinic that's got the exact same policies, getting the same phone call two times, a quarter of these clinics had variable response, and that variable response could potentially have been driven by the reason that a patient needed their opioids. And so there was this kind of subjectivity to the acceptance um, process. So, you know, this basically going back to our conceptual model means that, you know, 40% of our patients aren't even getting their foot in the primary care office to discuss their pain. Um, and then, you know, a good component, then there's no way they're having diagnosis and treatment planning. So, 
when that cat doesn't happen, the system's breaking down all around the pathway. But let's say they can get their foot in the door. Can they access specialty pain care? Because some would say, well, hey, maybe primary care is not where they should be treated. And so we call pain clinics and we look to see if they offer this multimodal treatment that HHS recommends. And we called 366 pain clinics across the country posing as a patient on long-term opioid therapy seeking care. We asked again about the insurances they accepted, their referral requirements, and the treatments they offered. And many of the pain clinics had restrictive acceptance policies. Roughly half of the pain clinics didn't accept Medicaid. Another half required a referral before accepting new patients. So that meant that their PCP had to give them a referral to get in. Well, we just found out that 40% of them can't get in the door to the PCP. And an additional 23% required a referral based on, you know, what, whatever their insurance was. And then we also found that less than 10% of the clinics we called actually offered a combination of procedures plus medication management plus behavioral therapy. Interestingly, we found more clinics, 19%, if you look to the left of the square, that actually offered procedures, medication management, and um, CBD products. So what are the barriers to accessing pain treatments? So we've, you know, through kind of experts and also our qualitative work, we've kind of basically, you know, described five major barriers to pain care, policy, payment, care coordination, stigma, and racial disparities. And, you know, these aren't all intellectually distinct, but, you know, I do describe them um, separately here, even though they are interlinked in many ways. So let's think about policy barriers. We've already talked about a little bit of this, but, you know, there are state and insurer policies around opioid prescribing that do add significant administrative burden and fear of litigation. And these can reduce providers' willingness to treat this patient population. And, you know, we discussed the CDC guidelines, the state of Michigan requirements, and also kind of insurance efforts. And these are just the, you know, this is just the, the bottom kind of break line. You know, each health system also um, institutes their own policies as well in order to closely adhere to these, um, to these regulations. And what we do know from other people's studies as well is that um, there was a survey that was done that said that 58% of their providers changed their practice due to the 2016 guidelines. 43% elect to not treat patients with chronic pain, and physicians do fear liability if they prescribe opioids. So, you know, we dug a little deeper. This was a qualitative study where we conducted qualitative interviewers, interviews with 25 stakeholders, including patients, providers, and office staff. And we really focused on office staff here because when I presented some of my initial secret shopper studies um, at conferences, physicians would often say, well, hey, I'm not the one who's answering the phone. It's my front desk staff that's making the decision about whether a patient can be here or not. And so we really wanted to kind of think through how this affects everybody in the care process. And we looked at questions focused on experiences with prescribing and receiving opioids, opinions about opioid-related policies, and challenges to providing or accessing effective care for chronic pain. And we learned quite a few big things. I'm going to show some quotes now, but I'll also sprinkle some qualitative quotes throughout the rest of the talk from, from this study. And, you know, we heard that, you know, quotes such as the DEA has scrutinized everything, extra time and paperwork involved in trying to get meds approved, Plus, the legal environment is such that we are cautious about writing anything. With respect to payment barriers, current coverage and reimbursement structures provide little compensation or coverage for pain management strategies. So, you know, as an example, primary care physicians often have 20, at most 30-minute appointments per visit to discuss a multitude of topics, not just chronic pain, um, but also their diabetes and their heart conditions. And what we do know is that there's wide variation in pain treatment coverage. So 90% of all public and private insurance plans cover physical and occupational therapy and chiropractic, but visit, um, but limit their visits and prior authorizations are often common for these treatments. So it's not that easy to actually get into any of these treatment options. Um, we did, you know, there's a review of essential health benefits by state and less than 10 states actually cover acupuncture, massage, or biofeedback, and zero cover mindfulness-based stress therapy, such as Tai Chi and yoga as well. 
And what do we hear from clinic staff about payments? You know, I just don't have kind of time for the conversation. So their, their visits are too short, reimbursement is low, and they can't actually get through the conversations. It kind of gets us out of having to accept the patients if the, if the insurance isn't going to pay for it. We have quite a few Medicaid patients and a lot of pain management providers don't necessarily take that. So it's a long time for them to get in. So this gets back to kind of our specialty pain clinic access as well. What about care coordination? So there's a lack of care coordination between providers, which can lead to gaps in receiving multimodal effective pain care and additional burden on the patient to manage multiple opinions and treatment plans. So, I mean, just thinking about it, you've got a PCP and a patient, but you've also got a pain specialist, a behavioral support, and alternative therapies in our ideal model of multimodal treatment. And all of these people have to be coordinating with the patient and also the PCP. And so we would hear this, you know, is that this was just too burdensome. Uh, you know, our new policy is we just don't do pain management. There are not enough counseling agencies to deal with chronic pain. Chronic pain is a multi-system issue that requires a PCP, a pain specialist, and a psychotherapist for mental health. We are talking about three things here. How about stigma? We talked a bit about stigma in our secret shopper study. But I think it's important to kind of understand just how kind of deep stigma runs with respect to chronic pain and opioids. Um, so there's always been a stigma around chronic pain and addiction, which make it difficult for this patient population to find physicians and receive quality care when they do. And there's lots of different forms of stigma, and this is just kind of touching on the surface of this. But with respect to chronic pain, there's often a disbelief of the pain. And this comes from this idea that we, if we can't see where somebody has been injured um, or the lesion isn't visible on a radiograph, um, that maybe their pain isn't real. Um, it's, you know, sometimes physicians will use the word real or organic or things like that to describe pain. And this really comes from the sense that perhaps this pain just doesn't exist and this disbelief that patients are actually describing something legitimate. There's also a fear around illegitimacy of opioid therapy. And this is, I think, become pretty common now, especially with kind of randomized controlled trials that have shown that in patients with, who, have, who are opioid naive, receiving opioid therapy for chronic pain is um, not superior to getting non-opioid options. And so some physicians will argue, well, opioids are never warranted um, based upon this RCT for chronic pain. And so if there's a belief that all opioids are illegitimate, um, then there can be a stigma around anyone who's already receiving that therapy, particularly patients who've been receiving it for many years. And the third type of stigma that often exists for individuals who have chronic pain is this underlying assumption that the patient has an addiction because they are dependent on um, opioids, which Dependence, physical dependence, is independent of, of addiction. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have an addiction. To have an addiction, you have to have loss of compulsion, control, and your roles and relationships in life, and not just have physical dependency on a medication. And so when you put all of these three kind of theories together, you've got quite a bit of stigma that builds up for this patient population. And we hear this from clinic staff. Um, Mental illness um, overlies the use of chronic pain in medicines. And seemingly, I guess, um, you know, patients that are kind of, quote, drug seeking that have a lot of issues. So even this, this theory around drug seeking. Now, that's really going back to the point that I made that most chronic pain patients do not need opioids. They need care for their pain. And, um, and this kind of gets back to some of this kind of underlying belief of illegitimacy of the, the treatment for any situation. And then there's also racial disparities, which impact access to pain care. So we know based on for the host of studies that have been done before me um, that describe differential pain treatment provided to patients based on their race. So racial and ethnic minorities have reduced access to healthcare in general and specialty care in particular. And we, we know this just based off of access to clinical providers, but there's also limitations in access to that broader health system, including pharmacies. For example, 
pharmacies located in minority neighborhoods are less likely to carry sufficient analgesics than those in white neighborhoods. Um, we also know that Blacks and Hispanics are less likely to receive an opioid medication than whites within the healthcare system. They often receive lower doses of pain medication and experience longer wait times to receive pain medications. They're also more likely to receive referrals for substance use disorder assessments when um, needing prescription opioids for pain. They get fewer referrals to pain specialists and they also um, have increased urine drug tests. So why does this happen? In general, it happens for a lot of reasons, but they're more, you know, racial and ethnic minorities are more likely to experience miscommunication and misinterpretation about their pain. Some doctors still choose to believe that pain levels are actually lower for blacks than whites or that minorities are drug seekers. And physicians are more likely to underestimate the amount of pain that African-Americans are experiencing. So how do we fix this? Um, you know, I've talked about multiple barriers um, and a complex issue, and it's clear that what we are doing isn't actually addressing the opioid epidemic, right? We've curved opioid prescribing, but as I described in the first slide, um, you know, opioid-related overdoses keep rising. And so there's a disconnect here between what opioid prescribing, you know, these policies were intended to curb overdoses, um, but instead, you know, we are seeing the exact opposite happening. There's also substantial barriers to care for patients with pain. So maybe, maybe kind of these policies, the pendulum has swung too far. But honestly, there's little appetite at this point to repeal these deep prescribing policies, because I think underlying all of these policies is this belief that if we can decrease the supply of prescription opioids, we can decrease the number of people that are kind of entering into a potential scenario where they would have an opioid use disorder. Whether or not that is true, we do not know, but that is kind of the hope of many of these policies. So even when we notice that the overdoses are still climbing, we're still kind of holding on to this little bit of hope that like, well, maybe what we're doing now, even though the overdoses keep climbing right now, will make an impact 15 or 20 years from now. Um, but I've, I'll argue that maybe what we're doing here is a little narrowly focused on a single substance rather than actually kind of treating the underlying reasons for the use of these medications, which is things like chronic pain. So what now? Um, and let's talk about some potential solutions. So with all of this going on, um, we really wanted to think through, well, with with this scenario, what can we do? What, how can we fix this situation? And so our team convened stakeholders from across the state of Michigan in November 2020 through January 2021 to conduct a modified Delphi, which is basically an expert panel, um, to reach convergence on ideas for solutions. And our objective was to create a prioritized list of recommendations to reduce um, treatment access barriers for patients taking prescription opioids for chronic pain. And we, we basically looked at ratings and rankings of recommendations scored on feasibility, impact, and importance, and we ranked them by implementation priority. So we averaged them to kind of produce a finalized prioritized list. And these 24 panelists came from across the state of Michigan. They included patients, included payers, physician experts, um, policymakers, and they developed 11 final recommendations that were narrowed down from 15. And there were basically three major themes that emerged. One is that we need to improve care models through reimbursement reforms. Two, we should be enhancing provider education. And three, we've got to address racial um, disparities. So with respect to improving care models through reimbursement reforms, um, of the three, the top two uh, basically stated that we wanted to increase reimbursement for the time required to treat chronic pain. So, you know, those 20 minute PCP visits aren't enough. Um, and so if we want people to really think through other multimodal treatment options and not just treat with medications, um, then people, you know, providers need to get increased reimbursement for actually treating chronic pain. And number two is we needed to establish coordinated care models to bundle the payment for multimodal pain treatment. Um, and so we needed to really think through not just reimbursing the PCP or the pain specialist, but reimbursing for physical therapy, 
um, for um, cognitive behavioral therapy and other forms of treatment uh, that are required to successfully carry out multimodal pain treatment. With respect to provider education, there was quite a bit about um, how one, you know, there's not a ton of robust data on a lot of the non-opioid and non-pharmacologic um, treatment options, but there is enough to say that, you know, they definitely don't do any harm and um, can provide a therapeutic benefit for many people. And so, you know, really thinking through this emphasis on non-pharmacologic care and reducing stigma towards opioid dependence and opioid use disorder. And so, um, really educating people during health professional school around non-medication-based treatment options. And with respect to addressing racial disparities in care, there was a lot around, um, you know, thinking about the focus on reducing the impact of provider bias. Um, and there was some kind of discussion around whether implicit bias type trainings would do the job or whether they were just kind of, um, I don't know, making us feel better for doing something. Um, versus really thinking through standardizing protocol treatment for pain um, to make sure that everybody was receiving equitable care. So in conclusion, um, the panelists really felt that there should be kind of some combination of restructuring reimbursement models, improving provider education, and addressing racial inequities in care. And that all of these together um, could really meaningfully improve uh, access to care. And we did try to get people to kind of rank, you know, reorganize them and try to think through what meant more, you know, what should we should do first versus later. And certainly reimbursement kind of climbed to the top of that pile of recommendations. But in general, there was little dis distance between um, the rankings. And so people really felt like all of these changes were necessary. So before I get done, um, I, you know, I also wanted to discuss, you know, what has been going on kind of recently politically as well. Um, so last week, uh, the CDC released uh, their updated 2021, um, or I guess 2022 guidelines on prescribing opioids for pain. And this really um, emerged because of a lot of what I just discussed today around kind of the 2016 guidelines, um, you know, whether or not they went too far or were they, whether they were just kind of interpreted um, by policymakers as a reason to implement, you know, pretty strict opioid prescribing policies. And so this new guideline that was released really, one, started with a very lengthy introduction um, addressing kind of patient abandonment and clinics kind of closing their doors and basically said, you know, that was not their intent ever um, with the 2016 guidelines. And in a, an attempt to kind of course correct, these new guidelines have much, you know, increased emphasis on patient-centered care rather than strict adherence to dosing thresholds. So they, you know, explicitly have kind of taken out any numbers that could be um, misinterpreted by policy agencies and applied um, to care. They also have you know quite a few paragraphs in there discouraging our regulatory bodies and policymakers from using the guidelines as the basis for like one size fits all policy and really argue about how chronic pain is a complex disease that's experienced you know variably by each individual and that kind of one size fits all policies are, are not going to be successful um, in this space. They've also, you know, increased um, the discussion around multimodal treatment. So they really write these guidelines kind of hand in hand with the HHS guidelines for multimodal treatment and argue for um, improving those. <laughs> um, I will say, I don't think they provide a roadmap for how to do it. Um, and it doesn't get too much into kind of the idea of reimbursement policies, but hopefully um, these new guidelines will kind of stir on potentially a more thoughtful um, approach to the way we pay for, for pain treatment. And so, you know, a lot of people have been saying, well, will these changes be enough to kind of shift the balance between kind of effective pain treatment and the risk of opioid use disorder? 
And I, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm hopeful that the new guidelines will force a discussion around where we've gone wrong. Um, but I do think that providing such individualized care is, um, is sometimes harder. Uh, and then kind of having this prescription prescribed kind of roadmap to how to do things properly. And the 2016 guidelines in many ways were, you know, some of the most cited guidelines that ever existed. Um, I don't think anyone reads the hypertension guidelines nearly as closely as the 2016 chronic pain opioid prescribing guidelines. And so I think the question comes from like, why did these guidelines take on so much? And I think that they filled a void where we didn't have one. Um, I think we were one searching for solutions to curb the overdose crisis and to um, I think the guidelines gave us a scapegoat for discontinuing care for a patient population um, that maybe we didn't really want to care for. Um, so there was a lot of underlying stigma there as well. And so the question will be whether this release of the new guidelines will bring upon a bigger discussion around how we really think about effective pain treatment as a whole outside of just opioid therapy. Um, and, and what that means with relationship to an opioid use disorder. So I'll stop there. Um, you know, big thank you to I, you know, my divisions, um, IHPI for having me here and my mentors, um, my research team. And I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Pooja. Yeah. Um, there were a couple questions submitted earlier. I think you sort of answered one of them throughout your presentation, but I don't know if you want to um, touch on them. Do you want me to read them if you can't see the chat yeah. or you're welcome to um, also stop sharing? So oh, yeah, let me better. stop sharing. That's a good idea. Although now that I said that, probably you'll want to reference back to your slide. <laughs> Um, it's okay. Um, I can get back to it. So um, can I share uh, thoughts on the recent, I guess, I, you know, the CDC updates for prescribing guidelines. I kind of touched on this already. Um, I, I don't think, you know, my personal thoughts are that I think that they've done a good job of trying to kind of course correct and respond to all of the unintended harms that have happened. Um, and they do make a, a strong argument um, for individualized uh, patient-centered treatment, I think, in this guideline. Do I think it's going to make, you know, insurers and everyone else walk their policies back? I think maybe it will help remove some of the dosing thresholds that were applied. Um, but I think it's just really hard to provide this individualized therapy. And so what is really going to be needed is policies that counterbalance the ones that we've already implemented that really emphasize this multimodal treatment. Um, and those types of policies are gonna take a lot of money. Um, and so I think that's where we're gonna have to see whether there's investment um, to really think about complex pain management effectively. And then the second question was around the opioid settlement. So the opioid settlement does have a section around prevention um, around opioid prescribing and making sure that we are doing a good job at opioid prescribing. But again, the language is all kind of opioid centric and focus on opioid prescribing and not so much on effective pain treatment. Um, and so the opioid settlement funds will fund anything that we kind of think about as kind of opioid risk prevention. Um, but the language is not so much around, let's think about how to provide multimodal pain treatment and let's think about how to, you know, effectively treat pain um, beyond this kind of laser focus on opioids alone. Terrific. Thank you. We have a question in the chat, but first we have a raised hand. So I'm going to go to that and then we'll go back to the chat. And please, everyone, keep questions coming in the chat or go ahead and raise your hand. Um, Kim? Would you like to jump in with a question or comment? Can oh, you think, unmute? It looks like it's Chad, but it says Kim on his screen. Oh, I, uh, yeah. Everybody... It says Kim on my screen? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does. <laughs> really? Yeah. I don't know how I'm that happened. Fix That's that, <laughs> oh, there is Kim right there. And Kim's also there. <laughs> Kim, Kim's also there, but I have no idea why it says Kim That's on my so screen. That's so weird. 
Anyway, um, Pooja, great work as always. Um, it, it's it's such an incredible body of work and it's compelling. And you know, you've definitely directly influenced these revised guidelines. I mean, your work direct, I, I hear your work cited all the time from physicians, from policymakers, from um, patient advocates. And you know, it's it's really created a stir. And I think it, it a good way made us think. I guess the question I come back to is, um, you know, we were probably one of those cl clinics that had to say, if you're outside of Michigan medicine early on, when the CDC guidelines came out, um, we can't we can't just take all the patients who now, after 20 years of being managed in primary care, no longer all, all of a sudden all these PCPs sort of threw their arms up and said, I can't do this anymore. And we had to we had to put a no on it, right? Because people were really truly just trying. And that said, we're probably one of the clinics that um, is most likely to take these patients in. Um, and so I, I struggle a little bit with, um, you know, what is the right answer? Because um, most of the time, especially in the pain clinic domain, the pain physicians aren't usually the people who initiate the opioids. And yet um, there is that sense of like um, needing to sort of own it or when it becomes challenging. And the volume is I think more than we can handle. What, what's the right answer for, for our pain clinics? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think this is the situation that a lot of us also in primary care deal with. You know, I haven't been practicing that long. Um, and, you know, I also care for patients that were started on long term opioid therapy far before I inherited them in my patient panel as well. Right. And so I don't think we can think of it as like, oh, I'm who dealt it is the person who deals with it. Right. Um, I think that unfortunately, you know, we can't think of things in that way, right? Um, especially as kind of specialists and primary care physicians. I think that that theory, that kind of discussion around, well, that's not my fault and, you know, finger pointing has unfortunately kind of led to um, a lot of stigma between provider types as well around, you know, whose patient population is this? And I would argue that chronic pain is all of our patient population, right? The same way, you know, primary care physicians see patients with, you know, um, cardiovascular disease, once things get too difficult, we up the ante and we send them to our specialist colleagues. But that doesn't mean that that's not our responsibility anymore. But there are certain situations where it's appropriate to kind of uh, transfer that care to a different provider. Um, but with respect to like the large volume of patients that are on long-term opioid therapy and how we can manage this patient population, I would argue that we were managing this patient population before these policies came into play. Um, but I think that these policies kind of gave, like I say, coming back to stigma, a way for providers to wash their hands of it and say, oh, I never really loved taking care of this patient population, or I never really loved prescribing opioids in the first place. And so here's my way of just being like, I'm not going to do it anymore. Um, and I think that that is unfortunately what's happening a lot. Do I think payment policy plays a big role? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Like when a pain doctor is going to get you know, two times as much money for doing an injection. And that injection takes, you know, 15 to 30 minutes um, versus a long, complex discussion around, um, you know, opioid prescribing and tapering and frequent monitoring that's going to get reimbursed at a lower level. Um, it, it makes that care seem unappealing, right? And so, I think this is where we really have to think through if we really want PCPs to take this ownership back on, we have to give them the support and the reimbursement to do so. And what I did find in those secret shopper studies was that the clinics that were most willing to take on this patient population were the federally qualified health centers who often do have greater social support and social workers, et cetera, accept broader health insurance policies um, and just are better supported. They also have Kind of an ethos around accepting all patients um, because that is, you know, the type of clinic that they are. And so I think they have a little bit of a lower stigma level and then they also have increased resources. And so I really think that that's what this is going to come down to is increased resources and an acknowledgement um, that, you know, that we can't just wash our hands of this situation. Um, and this idea that if we just like don't accept these patients and don't prescribe opioids, that like the misuse will just suddenly go away, um, won't happen, right? Because people will seek pain treatment from other sources um, if they if they're in pain. Thanks, Pooja. 
I, I think the issue too is it's it's a volume issue. It's just like literally, if you if you become the clinic that does it, and I'm not saying that you're not right here, you become the clinic that does it. Um, your volume of referrals only increases. The word gets out quickly. Um, but and, if you were it's, paid it's, more, you would be willing to do it. I mean, we found yeah, that no, less no. than ten percent of yeah. these pain clinics were willing to even do it. Um, and so there's payments. still ninety yeah. percent of clinics <laughs> that yeah. have yeah. room to expand. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Anyways, it's great work. I really appreciate it. I'm looking. Thank you. There's a. Um, you mentioned proposing standardized protocols and addressing racial inequities for chronic pain and prescribing opioids. What are some of these example protocols? And how is it specifically tailored to those racial groups most impacted? Um, so we didn't get into the details of what these protocols would look like, but I can discuss a little bit about what the Delphi panel was trying to get at. Um, so a lot of the discussion during this expert panel kind of came down to, um, in some ways, thinking about, I, I guess an analogy would be, you know, percutaneous intervention for, um, for a heart attack and how once kind of that protocol was standardized that you know, once a patient hits the ER, they have to be, you know, if they have evidence of, uh, of a heart attack, they have to kind of see a, you know, be linked up with an interventionist within kind of an hour and a half or quick times. We saw racial disparities with respect to, um, to MI kind of really improve over time. And so the thought was that similar standardization needs to happen uh, around uh, pain treatment. And so, um, so that, you know, if, if we are enacting multimodal treatment and we are giving, re, you know, reimbursement policies for these types of treatments, that everybody should have access to this time to get this treatment. And then similarly for pain treatment, let's say in acute care settings like the ER and things like that, um, that there be kind of standardization put in place so that everybody is offered um, the treatments that they, you know, warrant rather than what a lot of our ER data shows, which is... Um, you know, patients who are black and brown are receiving treatment much lower and much slower um, than their colleagues who are white. But I think that there's a lot of room to be done around what these protocols would look like. Other questions, comments? I don't see any more hands. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Pooja. I don't see any more questions coming in. Very compelling, thought-provoking talk for us today. Um, we'll go ahead and 